welcome everyone to the eighth installment of Image Think Series, Ask the Expert, where I sit down remotely with leaders and innovators to get to explore the more practical application of all their expertise in our everyday business setting. These events are also your opportunity to ask our experts anything you'd like. So type out any questions you have in the chat on LinkedIn, or for those of us joining us from Clubhouse, welcome. Post your, raise your hand or post your comments in Clubhouse as well, and we'll address them. For all of you who don't know, I'm Nora Herding, the founder and CEO of ImageThink, a visual facilitator, a graphic recorder, thinker, and author. And a few weeks ago, I received a newsletter email from Dan Seewald. I was so excited about the article. I immediately emailed him and asked if he would be our next guest expert. Fortunately, Dan said yes, and I'm excited to bring to you the experience and the insightful approach and the wealth of knowledge that Dan brings to the topic of innovation. So actually this month, it, instead of Ask the Expert, we've renamed it in honor of Dan uh, and called it Ask the Innovator. So Dan, thank you so much for, for joining us. Really excited about this conversation. Thanks for having me. And I, what an honor to be the the inspiration for a new brand name. It's not often that people <laughs> tell me that. So yeah, we, I can't we wait like to, to change it up. We like to change it up. Let me just before we get started, I, I want to try to distill your amazing uh, credentials and bio it, for the audience here. So for those of you who don't know Dan Seewald, he is a professor, a facilitator, a moderator, and a featured TED Talk keynote speaker. Dan advises on and applies the deliberate innovation system, which is a methodology used to transform the traditional innovation workshop and advisory board experience by blending behavioral science with design thinking. And it's brilliant. Dan is also the former head of Pfizer's worldwide innovation group, where he architected and led the Dare to Try program which was one of Fortune 100 companies leading corporate innovation programs. It's really impressive to think about such an innovative company like Pfizer and Dan, you know, setting up the, the entire program and training innovators across the entire enterprise. So now clients seek out Dan because he has a foot both in the corporate world as well as a number of companies that are startups. Uh, he's also a certified coach and when I say coach, I don't just mean the kind of mental coach that we're thinking about, but Dan is also an actual wrestling coach. So he really lives uh, what he does. So again, thank you so much, Dan, for, for joining. I know we have so much to cover today, but I really, um, I wanted to kind of start with the, the article that I mentioned that uh, made me so excited for you to, to be a guest on our show, um, and that is using metaphor. Uh, you know, we talk about metaphor and image think. We use it a lot at image think to help communicate, right? For leaders to communicate the direction of strategy or to create a story of change. But what was so compelling about your piece is you're advocating for using metaphor way before decisions are made, but really as a vehicle for problem solving and innovation. So I'm going to stop there and, and turn it over to you. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, deodorant and uh, metaphor. Yeah, that's I'm I'm glad you bring it up about metaphors because it is it is not my own inspiration. The, the idea of metaphors as a source of new or more novel ideas has been around for nearly a hundred years and you know like what's what's old is new it's ecclesiastes you know we we learn from the past but it goes back to a method called triz which a Russian, a Russian cosmonaut um, who was in prison in a gulag had worked on while he was imprisoned. He it has been evolved in multiple other incarnations, a guy named Bill Duggan from Columbia University. Um, it's, it's far from new, but what I find is, is most organizations, most innovators do not tap into the power of metaphors. And, and metaphors, what makes them so important and so powerful, it allows us to think where else has your problem or your need been seen before and where has it been solved? And that simple question opens up a myriad of possibilities. You could look at a business challenge and look far afield to agriculture, 
to um, metaphysics, to robotics, to other companies like Netflix or Airbnb. It starts to invite many different inspirations by thinking, where else has this been applied? How did it work there? How can I apply it in my own world? And that's what's powerful is that we sometimes get trapped in our own world, our own business, our own brand and teams. And because of that, we kind of get this myopia. This use of metaphors allows you to look far outside. Um, thinking of deodorant, since you brought that up. So that's a really old story that, that also, when dusted off, people love to hear about it because long ago, there was a deodorant company that, you know, back in the old days, they had a spray deodorant. Um, and that's kind of how they would apply it. And they found when they sprayed it in their armpits, it got all over the place. It got on their shirts. It got on their shoulders. It was very inconvenient. And, you, you know, people were, were not clamoring. I want something brand new, but they'd complain about it. So the company started to think about how could we solve this? And they went through all the normal Kind of kind of trials and tribulations of doing product development and they just didn't come up with anything novel or they felt that really solved the problem so one guy who'd been exposed to triz had said well where else do we have trouble consistently applying a, a spray or a, a fluid and they started to look at a lot of places painting like painting a house um, they started to look in other places as well. They looked in lawn care. And then they spotted something really interesting, the ballpoint pen. For those who maybe remember the old days of using a fountain pen, I remember my grandfather teaching me calligraphy with a fountain pen. You'd get ink all over your hands and it would spread everywhere. I was a terrible calligrapher. Um, but what it, what it really taught them or showed them is that the ballpoint allowed you not to spread ink everywhere. It kept it very isolated and it used a rollerball technology. So they said, aha, this is the big idea or the inspiration for insight, if you will. And they said, well, what if we applied the rollerball technology to deodorant, which they did. And it ultimately became the Ban Roll-On, if you know the company Ban. The Ban Roll-On was inspired by the rollerball technology in a, in a ballpoint pen. So they borrowed inspiration and metaphor from a completely disparate field, something they probably wouldn't have looked at. They wouldn't have gone to a, uh, you know, a writing company or an ink company like BIC or, or uh, uh, the, uh, you know, any other companies that were developing the rollerball. They would have gone to the usual suspects. But by doing that, they found inspiration, allowed them to think about the problem and a solution in a completely different way. And if you look throughout product development, more times than not, people talk about it being serendipity, but it's not serendipity. It's seeing things in other places that may not have applied immediately, but they found a metaphorical relationship. So I believe that you can actually harness this type of inspiration yourself. In fact, I know you can. And it takes a little bit of work. It doesn't happen the first time. The more the metaphors, the merrier and the better. So that that's a little bit about metaphors. There's lots of great ones out there. You'll see them yourself. Um, happy to share more of them. But that's a little bit about metaphors and why I feel so passionate about it. I see them create breakthroughs all the time. So that that's why we started to kind of lean into this with deliberate innovation. Yeah, that is that I love that story. It's a great story too because it also underscores, you know, it doesn't have to be a completely original idea, right? As you said, the ball the rollerball technology already existed. It was just that it was in a different industry and it wasn't applied to deodorant. And so it was an innovation within that industry. Um, you know, and I think oftentimes I see lots of clients just look within their own industry to their competitor. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a great reminder of it for those of us, you know, for that would like to try this out for, for folks on LinkedIn, which is great. I'm seeing there's folks from the UK, from, uh, the Czech Republic, from New York and those on clubhouse, what would you say might be one or two tips for, uh, if they want to try to put this practice of metaphor uh, to help innovation or breakthrough problem solving that they should start with, Dan. Yeah, I, I, th I think the, the, the easiest thing to do is take a simple problem that you're facing. It could be in your personal life. It could be in your professional life 
write it out as a clear problem statement. And, and while we're, our goal is not to talk about problem definition, which I really do believe is that if you understand the problem first and really deep understanding, you're going to be in a much better place to use metaphors. But try to write it as a question, a how might we question. So how might we find more time to uh, enjoy our children? How might we uh, be able to get our laundry to wash itself because we don't have enough time for our laundry to get washed because we're so busy with our children. You know, take a take a, a a mundane challenge or take a more you know a slightly complex challenge that you have in your workplace. State as a question, and then start by asking, where else has somebody seen a problem like this before? Now it may take you a little bit of work to unpack your question because a lot of times the questions are so convoluted and filled with business speak we lose the intent of what the actual problem is. You, know, you think about the big example um, or the, you know, the ban roll on example, the, uh, you know, they looked at it and said, you know, we're having trouble applying a deodorant, but what they were really facing is it applied unevenly. So where else do you see things that apply unevenly? So take your problem, try to agnostically translate it or not other words, generalize it in such a way that you, you might have to keep peeling it back a little bit more and a little bit more. Tell it to a, to a child or to someone who knows nothing about the problem. Once they sort of understand the essence of it, then you can ask them, where else have you seen something like this? You'll be amazed how quickly people say, oh yeah, that's kind of like this, or it's kind of like that. Some of them may be very obvious ones and that's okay. Um, but the more you dig, the more you practice, doing it yourself or asking a few friends, you'll start to find more and more interesting metaphors that can unlock the potential. So start with something real in your life and uh, and then go from there. And it is like anything else in life. It's about habit. You got to practice it. A lot of people will say to me, ah, this doesn't work. I tried it. Well, how many times did you try it before? Once, twice. That's not enough. You know, and you mentioned about coaching. There is no way anybody would ever step foot on a mat to wrestle or step foot on a soccer pitch to play soccer without having practiced over and over and over again. So it's about habit and practice and working on it. So if you don't get the first time, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means you got to work at it. So that would be a little bit of my, my suggestions about what you can do individually. Great. That's so helpful. So it sounds like if we wanted to distill that down, one is is choose a real problem that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love to hear from some folks uh, that maybe want to throw out some that, that they might have uh, on LinkedIn in the comment section. Today, we're, if, you, if you make a comment, we're going to choose uh, somebody uh, to who's posted a comment or a question to receive a copy of our book, Draw Your Big Idea. So we'd love to hear from folks. You know, what is that problem? Make it real. And then it sounds like you're also saying, um, distill it down. I, I love what you're saying. Like, imagine that you're telling Simplify. a child, like, what is the, the root, you know, the root problem when you strip everything else away? And yeah. I think that's great because then it should be easy to see how it must relate to someone else. I mean, I think a lot of times when we, if we don't do that, we think, oh, our problem is so specific to our industry. Oh, our problem is so specific to our division or our clients, right? And one thing I've noticed in, in 12 years of doing the work at ImageThink, um, and when people say, well, how, you know, how can you support uh, a pharmaceutical meeting or how can you support uh, a meeting at NASA without obviously a science background, it's because really the truth is um, um, once you, ba you bake it down and you boil it down, most organizations are really wrestling with the same few problems. I don't know if you, is that, does that sound? Uh, it definitely it, resonates. To, to, to you as someone with a background at Pfizer, or would you in your work agree with that, Dan? Yeah, I, I would say I'll, I'll double down on that comment because the, the work that I've done in healthcare, life sciences, pharmaceuticals for a couple of decades, you would say, wow, you're really a vocational expert just in healthcare. How could you possibly help out an oil and gas company? Or how could you possibly understand industrial manufacturing? And there are a couple of things I would say, or a few things I would say about that. Number one is that the practices of applied creativity and innovation cut across industry. The second thing is 
highly regulated industries and companies are more alike than they are dissimilar. It, you know, it's uh, you, you find these very similar patterns across them. And I hear the same statements, the same concerns, the same obstacles. And that doesn't eliminate the the uniqueness that a you know a chemical manufacturer faces versus a company that does um, you know architectural glass for example they are different but there's also a lot of verisimilitude so you find those and you see how you can search for solutions across that matrix and in fact that's one of the great things about working across a lot of industries what works in glass manufacturing may also work in biotech and but they don't see each other they don't talk to each other so one of the other things that we do a lot of is that we will run panels and events where we bring in external thinkers from other industries other disciplines to join our colleagues our clients so that they will bring a different perspective but that means that we have to understand it we need to really dig in listen and ask great questions so that we can get to the essence and you know while the simpler seems like it's you know not important to have it's better to have the nuance it's getting from the nuance and getting to the simplicity which is what matters that's what allows you to get to the metaphors it's what allows you to find and source people from different domains to solve your problem so i really do think that that the more dissimilar we think we are you'll be amazed to see how much more alike you are than you think yeah, that's great. I love that uh, move from the new the, the nuance to the simplicity because I completely completely agree, and that I think is something a gift that you and and I and our work can bring to clients is being able to have that privilege of working across industries and seeing that uh, we're not so special with the things that hold us back or challenges we have. Um, I'm sure there's lots of people who are joining us right now that have some of the same topics or problems that, you know, they think are so special or maybe just they're dealing with in their own industry that are across industries. Something else that came up that I'd, I'd love to to have you touch upon in the story um, about metaphor is, you know, one limitation, I think, is we stay in our own jargon, our own industry, and we, we don't look across them. But another one is something called the expert's dilemma. So you want to speak maybe a little bit about what that is and how people can try to break out of the expert's dilemma. Yeah, it's, uh, so there's a couple ways to, to think about this. So the expert's dilemma, or sometimes I refer to as the knower's mindset, uh, it harkens back to the work um, of that, that about the fixed mindset. Uh, Carol Dweck, her book somewhere on the back of my shelf here. Carol Dweck was uh, worked in uh, academia and education, and she talked about the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset. Well, when it comes to innovation in organizations, there is a slight kind of nuance or, or different play on that, which is the expert's mindset, which can be often falsely evenly equated to the, uh, the fixed mindset. And then there's the learner's mindset. So let me step back for a second and just tell you a couple of things about the expert's mindset. When you are in a highly regulated company, like a pharmaceutical or in an oil and gas company or a bank, you rely on people to be experts. You need for the experts to be there. So it's not a bad thing to have expertise. In recent times, we've heard a lot of sort of uh, critique of the experts. Oh, the experts think they know, they get it wrong. Um, and there was actually some research, a guy named Philip Tetlock from uh, the University of Pennsylvania. He did a very longitudinal research about forecasting and expertise and that often the experts don't not only not get it right, but it could be almost not so different than a coin flip when it comes to forecasting, which begs the question, do the experts know? Well, they do. They need some shaping of their, their thinking, and we rely on them because we don't always have the deep expertise. But the challenge is, is that you get so wedded to your supposition, so wedded to your beliefs, that it can be very difficult for you to think outside of the known and the familiar. And that's why it's really important we not just have our experts and subject matter um, folks that are involved in things, but that we coach our experts to be able to stop and challenge their thinking. It's really hard. You know, if you've done a PhD and you've done a postdoc and you've spent years in a very focused area and somebody says, you know what, you should question the basic assumptions of what you do, you'd probably say, 
I, I don't believe this malarkey. Like, I'm going to look at this the way I've always looked at it. Why should I challenge the way I've done things? It's worked for me. It what got me where I am. And the challenge is, is that as an expert and a company that relies purely on expertise is that you're going to do things the way you've always done them before. So you have to be able to challenge your basic assumptions. And it's not so easy. People talk about it, but there's technique and method to be able to get the experts to be able to not just be knowers, but also to be learners. And it's tricky. Is very, very tricky. And uh, one more thing I'll say is it's not just the subject matter experts or opinion leaders in an organization or an institution. It's also the senior leaders because what got them where they are has been their expertise, their insider knowledge. So to do things different is very tricky. But if you don't do things differently, you're going to end up in sort of this endless cycle of corporate ennui. Just the things being the way they always were. And we know disruptors are out there. We need to eat your lunch. So they have to think different, but they've always have done it that way. And that is the dilemma that you face as an expert or as an insider in any institution or industry. So you have to embrace a learner's mindset. You have to practice it all the time because otherwise you're just going to fall into the known and familiar patterns that you've relied on your whole career. And most people have applauded. So I, I would say that this only touches the surface of it. Um, it sounds easy. It's not. It's very difficult. And it's even more difficult to get any organization to start to challenge their experts because they need them and they, they don't want to ruffle their feathers. Right. So right. it is difficult, very difficult it is situation. It's really difficult. And um, those of you, I see some questions coming in. This is a great time to pause for those. If you have a problem you're stuck in, this is a chance to, uh, to run it by Dan. Um, also talking about unpacking the, expert, uh, the expert's dilemma, which I, I do see as a really big limitation uh, whenever we have success, right? So Eric uh, is thinking about that as well. And so his question for you, Dan, is how do you address organizations which are key, which have a key need of innovation, yet the experts are risk averse, they play it safe, they have personalities that play it safe, and they basically are posing barriers to that innovation, right? So I think this is, Eric is in kind of the world of the expert's dilemma. Um, you acknowledge that it's really hard because it's the thing that has made you successful. And maybe at the, that point, there's not enough pain to, to have to change, right? Or to look at it differently. So, so Dan, what would you recommend for, for Eric um, yeah. here? It's, uh, so there, there's a lot of ways that you can go with this, and it depends on who you're talking to in the organization. Do they have the control and influence to make a change? Are they kind of in the trenches? And then you take a slightly different approach based on where they are in the matrix, the hierarchy of the organization. But let me take somebody who has more control than just indirect influence, a senior leader, which there's plenty of experts who are kind of in that in that mode. The question to ask them is, is what do you see happening in the next couple of years? What changes are afoot? And do you think it's going to impact you? And a lot of times we'll, we'll give them examples and try to avoid the trite examples of Kodak. Look what happened with Kodak when they missed the opportunity when it came to digital photography. We look for ones that are maybe adjacent or directly related to their industry so they can see what happens when you follow a safe and steady path. And there's lots and lots of examples of this, but you want to be able to tie it back to the behaviors that leaders embraced or didn't embrace for that matter. So it's literally showing or shining a light on them and showing where they are today, but where they could end up being. Classic example that, uh, that, that I'll share, a, uh, a gentleman who uh, uh, who will remain unnamed. He was the owner of a black car company. We spoke many years ago when I first moved into my neighborhood, one of the largest kind of uh, you know car services in the northern New Jersey area. Very big business, took it over from his family. And this was at the time that Uber was just kind of becoming a name, but a lot of people didn't know it. They didn't think it would make a big difference. And I asked them, um, you know, what do you think about Uber? How's it going to affect the you know black car service business? And he said, no, what? This isn't going to make a difference. It's 
trust and loyalty. You know, we're not going to do anything different. What got us here is what's going to keep us here. And it was very insistent and very dismissive. And, you know, as I kind of pressed about Uber, he said that nobody's going to Uber my business. Well, fast forward a few years later, probably about three, four years later, um, I ran into him again and we were just chatting. He clearly had no memory of our conversation we had at this barbecue. And I said, hey, how's business going? And he said, we're getting killed. We're down 30 percent. A lot of our, our customers that we were used to having who, who relied on us, they're starting to jump ship and go into these you know, ride share services. And we're just trying to figure out how to keep up. And he is kind of a, you know, a telltale story that he could have done something earlier on. What? I don't know. Um, but certainly there are things he could have done. He could have increased loyalty. He could have built in something else into his business model, could have diversified his portfolio. A lot of things he could have potentially done. But because he was unwilling to stare the alternative in the eyes, then he faced it. He faced the consequences, that is. So for me, when you talk to a leader, but maybe even somebody who is the rank and file, who's an expert, who's very resistant, give them examples about what, what some of the alternatives are. And they don't have to be these, you know, huge, you know, mega examples like Blockbuster and how they got disrupted by Netflix or Airbnb and Hilton and other companies like that. They could be very mundane examples. I find that when I bring those up, it gets people to stop and think and pause and say, what am I doing differently? And that could be actually losing your, your tenure, your role in an organization. It could be being disrupted directly by a competitor, but it could also be a bigger story or just a mundane one like, you know, this guy in his black car service. So people need to hear, they need to know that you're never safe. There's always a disruption right around the corner. And actually, one last thing I'll say is that you, you know, you think about a recession proof industry. One of the ones that comes to my mind is hair cutting, hairstylist. There's always a need for a hairstylist, right? It's, uh, you, you know, people are, are for the most part are growing hair, you know, hopefully. And, uh, you know, there's a demand for it. And if you were owned a salon and you for years have been running that salon, you're probably thinking, I'm just going to keep doing what I've done. Well, just to about a week or two ago, Amazon announced that in the UK, they're launching one of their, their beta tests to see how they can use uh, augmented reality and AR in opening up salons. So you might think that you're untouched, but they're out there. The disruptors are waiting. And there's tons of startups. We work and collaborate with lots of them. They're always thinking about Where's the low hanging fruit? How can I get into your industry? So if you're an expert, you're an incumbent, and you feel like, hey, it's it's worked, don't mess with it, look around. You're going to see lots and lots of, of bodies piled up, so to speak, um, of people who said the exact same thing. So it sounds like, and that all of that's true, and it's usually very chilling. You know, the blockbuster uh, story is its own sort of metaphor now, right, about needing to innovate. But it sounds like, Eric, your advising needs to have some kind of tough love conversations and maybe a little bit of, of fear and urgency um, with those uh, those folks. But certainly, Eric, you're not alone in, um, in what you're encountering. Um, I think that it's a hard mindset, even if you're the expert and you're trying to shift that mindset. So great questions. Keep posting them. We have another right. one. Um, Before you Kelly. do. So Kelly is Kelly Ford is actually director of global patient strategy and engagement in inflammation and immunology at Pfizer. Uh, and Kelly's question is, how do uh, oh she's got there's two questions here. Oh, sorry, this one's from Kelly Evans, director of digital strategy and design at Salesforce. So we'll come back to the other Kelly. Great questions is this one I think you're really gonna love to to answer is how do you get beyond innovation theater to real? innovation. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of piggyback on that because the last thing I was going to say is for Eric, you know, Eric, you can scare people. Fear is only a short term motivator for change. We found that through change management. It might be the thing that jars them and pushes them and says, hey, you got to do something. But the next thing you need to do is you got to go from that to actually the real doing. And that's around giving them example, giving proof, and giving method and practice to do things differently. So 
that's very close to Kelly's question, Kelly Evans's question, which is how do you go beyond innovation theater? Innovation theater, for those who it's become almost like a jargony term, but it's a real thing. It's, you know, where it's all, you know, it's all pomp and circumstance and show, you know, you get everybody jumping around and, you know, you, you introduce a couple of fun things about creativity and people have a good experience, which by the way, it does matter. Um, but then there's no there's no there's no stake behind the sizzle, so to speak. So you actually have to give people real things to do. You need to work on real problems. You need to teach and inculcate these practices within people. If you don't do that, then it is all theater. So what I find is you have to have a healthy balance between a little bit of theater because there are going to be people you have um, and it should be fun, but should also be meaningful. So you have to have that balance. And until people do it themselves, till you get their kind of hands dirty, it's all theoretical. It's all, it is still kind of theatrical or show. So get people's hands dirty, give them some relatable tools, get them to practice it. And I, and I you know, may talk about this later, but I'll just say it now, the best way to really learn something is to play it as a game. So learn it as a game, practice it. And then once you've kind of done that in a risk-free environment, then you're ready to let them do it for real. And that's where you move beyond the theater and you get into the realm of the real. And uh, and, and, I'm, and I'll, I'll say this now, that innovation is dirty. It's hard, it's messy. Any person who's run a startup company or launched a new venture will know that the excitement of that first burst of insights and ideas, that will keep you warm at night. That's the thing that's gonna keep you going. But then you gotta roll up your sleeves. You gotta get in there and you have to do work. You have to talk with customers. You have to iterate. You have to accept that things are not gonna work out the way you thought they were. People who think a polished idea is gonna come right out of a workshop and voila, I have what I need. You're buying into theater and you're just as guilty as the people putting on their performance. So accept that it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be messy, but anything worth doing is worth putting the effort and getting the sweat on your brow for. So. It's important to have a little bit of sizzle, but you got to give them some steak also. I, I think that that's great. Um, you know, a lot, you got a lot of passion there. I love the, the steak to me and tell me what you think in my experience is really about, and you have a, a, a great phrase that I'll get to. I think that this is sort of what you're talking about is really about one, yeah, are they innovating about something that's real? Is it a real problem? And the two, it really comes down to execution and leadership. Are there are there stakeholders, are there senior leaders that are endorsing this? And once the excitement of the workshop is over, is there a clear plan? Are people going to have the tenacity and the focus to move that from an idea to an action, right? Because it's one thing to have a great experience. And I do think it's important because for us in our own model, you need the engagement after you get the idea to move to the execution. So you need the buy-in, you need the excitement. But to me, the difference between just innovation theater and real change is what happens after the workshop, right? Yeah. So so I don't know, Dan, uh, would you say when you, you have this, I love this, which is um, this quote about ideas being commodities. <laughs> like an idea is a commodity. Um, and my understanding that's a little bit about, you know, ideas are cheap and execution is what's going to really, you know, make the Ubers of the world or the innovators of the world, uh, you know, conversation worthy. A hundred percent. That's, I, you know, ideas are commodities. Execution is the premium. And I think one of my professors when I was years ago at, at, at New York University taking an entrepreneurship class, he said, yeah, everybody's got ideas. He had a much more crass way of putting it, which I, you, you might guess what that, that expression is. But, um, you know, the, the thing is, is that you have lots of ideas. The thing is, you have to decide which one actually has potential and which one are people going to have passion around, which is most relevant to solving, which ones are going to push the and break the rules or the conventions, if you will, around what you're already doing. That's hard because you have to make choices. You can't develop five concepts simultaneously. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with teams and leaders that say, there's 15 great ideas. I want to develop them all. Good luck. You know what's going to happen? You're going to do nothing. And that's why you have to make choices. And you could do it serially. You can run experiments. 
something fails, shunt it to the side and start a new one. It's hard. People don't like to admit failure or mistake, and it's hard to, to, to actually turn back and say, let's go back to the beginning. Everybody hates doing that. Most people hate doing that, but you have to make it a discipline. But once you accept the fact that ideas are commodities, it's okay. It's okay for things not to be perfect, and it's okay for you to have ideas that, you know, that are sprouted and they're never going to actually see the light of day. But you have to really put your time in doing the development of those concepts. And that's, as I was saying before, that's where the hard work happens. And I'll, you know, just uh, some sort of frame of reference is that a couple of years ago, uh, other than doing advisory work and consulting with a lot of large companies, I put my money where my mouth is. And myself and a physician uh, started a, a, a healthcare device company um, with a, a women's femtech product. And it started with an awesome insight and in an idea which we were both really excited about and that's the fun part now it's been two years or so of hard work of iterating prototyping testing with people learning why it's not working going back and actually saying that didn't work let's go back to the drawing board talking to customers all throughout the process and saying yeah that's not working we got to do this all the while putting our capital and investors capital into it and saying we don't want to fail because you know you could talk about failure but it's hard to fail with other people's money and it's even harder with your own so <laughs> you, you know the truth of the matter is that's where the hard work comes is with any new venture or startup that you're you're doing is that the idea is the starting point. You got to make the right choices, but then you got to put the time in. And there's lots and lots that we could talk about. Where do you put the time in? How do you do it? Um, but that's the beginning, if you will, um, for me of the of the creative process. Yeah, it's certainly yeah. Not the end. So true, so true. So hopefully those are, are helpful, Kelly Evans, around how do you break it out of innovation theater? And uh, it sounds like the answer is a little tough. One is we gave, you know, Dan had some great tips about metaphor and simplifying the problem. But the other is, if you feel like it's going nowhere, think about what is happening after the, the innovation session or that theater is over and what's stopping it into coming to a full idea. So all of you, some great questions. This again is your chance to ask uh, Dan, the innovation expert, some questions about innovation problems that you're having, post them in LinkedIn in the comments section. Thank you for those of you joining us on Clubhouse. I wanna come back to Kelly uh, Ford, who has, I think her question is really, you know, maybe a question that she's trying to innovate around. So perhaps you can help her rather come up with the solution, give her some tips for how she might look at it, is she is struggling with how to empower patients to lead conversations with the HCP so that they get what they want. I think that this comes up over and over again um, with all of our healthcare clients uh, uh, and empowering patients. So this might be, I see you nodding your head, Dan, uh, a, a familiar, familiar question or challenge. And what would be some ways that you might encourage Kelly, what would be a metaphor or a way that she could take this back and, and maybe have a breakthrough or have a more innovative uh, conversation about how to tackle this? So it just so happens Kelly and I go way back. So Kelly is someone who who is a friend also, and this is a, a question which I think most life science companies are grappling with of, you know, and, and there's a lot of questions they're grappling with, but kind of empowered patient. So over the past, oh, I would say maybe decade, as we kind of march in technology becomes more proliferate and we become the, the shift of power starts moving towards the quantified and empowered patient that we look at how do they kind of change the balance of the dialogue in the past. Um, patients were uncomfortable having a conversation with uh, with a physician. They may be uncomfortable asking them to to prescribe a particular medicine or to consider something. And it's very, it's very tricky because they are the expert, the physician, the HCP, that is, is the expert. And we don't want to you know, we don't want to disturb the delicate genius. We don't want to upset the person who is knowledgeable and trained in this. And sometimes, you know, if you think about the life of a physician, whether you're in the United Kingdom or in the United States or most places in the world, physicians are really 
really busy. Uh, a friend of mine who is a, a physician said, on an average day, I'm seeing 40 patients during my office hours. That's an incredible churn. So you're going to stop them and break their rhythm. It, it feels a little bit off-putting and uncomfortable. So I think the question you'd have to do is unpack what's stopping or getting in the way of that patient having the conversation. One of the things I've articulated is it may be that they're uncomfortable challenging the experts. So where else have somebody been uncomfortable challenging an expert? Where else has somebody felt like they didn't have power, but they actually have been uh, in a position where they needed to challenge experts? One place certainly that comes to my mind just off the top of the head is in the military structure. In the U.S. military structure, for example, it would be almost unthinkable or it was unthinkable if you had a PFC, a private first class, saying to a captain, hey, I don't think we're doing things the right way or maybe we should try this differently. And that I mean, that would be like grounds of insubordination. Um but there's a, an analogy or a metaphor where it does work. In the Israeli military, it's not unusual for a, you know, a lower-ranked officer or non-officer to challenge or ask questions of an officer. And you might say, well, that's just because they're Israelis. That's kind of culture. You can't quantify culture. But actually, I think it comes back to practice, habit, and things that they do. They actually allow them, empower them to do problem solving. So does that help solve Kelly's question? I don't know yet. We probably have to generate another half dozen or more metaphors and say, well, where else? What are some other ways that people have felt or there's an imbalance of power? One's an expert, one's not to advocate their point of view. Um, and you'll start to see some of these potential insights, these sparks, these proto insights, they'll start kind of sprouting. And those will give you the hunches that you need to be able to create a breakthrough. And I'm sure if we actually spent like another 15, 20 minutes and did in a thoughtful methodological way, we probably would get a dozen or more with this group, probably a lot more of these, these starter thoughts that could help Kelly solve that problem. So yeah, without solving well, the problem, that's just this a bit for Kelly, for those of you listening and joining in, what yeah. would be to Dan's challenge, a metaphor, uh, one would be a power imbalance. I was thinking also politically, possibly um, uh, a, a, another potential problem is your you, there's time constraints, right? So it would be a metaphor where you're, you're trying to have a conversation, trying to get something done. There's some, some strict time constraints. Um, and I'll, I'll certainly when I see the doctor. I'll just note something here, Nora. One of the things you'll note is that if we choose the right pain point or if we choose the wrong pain point, then you'll start finding solutions. So you'll start finding those metaphors that may or may not work. Um, so you have to really understand and not proceed on assumption. So the Kelly's question could actually invite a lot of different elements to it that, that as we think about it, um, could leave you down different roads. So this goes back to really understanding before we start to try to solve. And I'll, I'll just kind of double click on that just a little bit more. The double click is, is that we often just jump right to ideas because ideas are fun. The, the understanding piece, the listening, the asking questions, the visually mapping a problem allows you to find the right place or the optimal place, maybe not the right place, but the optimal place to start. Once you have that, then you can start to, to really be expansive and be divergent in all the different ways that you could approach that problem from a metaphorical standpoint. So you could, this is, I think, a really just a great kind of, you know, example in action, not rehearsed in any way, that, that really could demonstrate how you could lead down the wrong ro road, or you could also go down the right road if you do the right things and take the right amount of time to be able to explore and understand the problem. Right. I, I agree. I think it's a great um, it's a great test case because it, we're not all doctors or in uh, life sciences, but we've all been patients for one thing or another. And it's a little bit like the design thinking uh, principle we talk about, too, which is how are you framing the problem up? You know, one could be, yeah, the patient doesn't feel empowered. Another one might be that uh, the HCP is booked so tightly that they don't allow for questions. Right. So depending on how you understand the problem or frame the problem, it's going to take you your ideas in a different direction. Um, so thank you, Kelly, for, for chiming in with that. It's a great, it's a great one. And for those of you out there it might be thinking, you know, let's put this into practice. What would be some metaphors for Kelly to, to think about this um, and, and truly understanding the problem? So 
Dan, this has been so much fun and we're, we're burning through our hour almost, but I want to, uh, I want to talk about innovation um, in terms of where we are right now with, you know, the disruption that we've had with COVID, uh, with, you know, image think like most companies, right? We, we all started working differently, working virtually. We started changing our service, supporting our clients virtually. How have you seen working with clients um, innovation change or the needs or the conversations around innovation while people have now come to work differently? Um, you know, I think that this innovation theater that, that Kelly Evans spoke to, you know, in, in our mind is all, you know, people together in a beautiful space with a whiteboard, which clearly is not happening a whole lot these days. So I'm just really curious if you want to share what has been your thought or your experience with clients around how innovation or the way we think or do innovation might have shifted. Yeah, it's it shifted a lot. So the, the biggest shift at a kind of a more macro level is if you think about you're working from home now. Maybe you went to the office on a daily basis. Um, you had a commute. You went into the office. You met with people. You were in, in meetings physically with people. Maybe not everybody, but a lot of people. Um, in that time, you were able to have sort of those respites or those moment pregnant moments to be able to reflect and meditate. Working from home, many people are now finding they're going from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. They are booked one after the next. Now, that sounds awesome when you think about productivity. A lot of companies are cheering this on. Then when you look at some of the, the uh, organizational level productivity figures that have been, uh, that have been produced and shared, uh, what you see is that, that we're at all time unprecedented levels of worker productivity. And that sounds great, except when you think about creativity and innovation, productivity is at times the enemy of innovation. Now, a lot of people don't think about productivity and, and sort of the economic sort of framing of productivity, but it's the time worked uh, for an individual person, the time allowed. So we've actually expanded our denominator, but that denominator expansion has come at the time you might've been on a train or in the car or walking home or taking a bike ride. We, it's eating away at those pauses and moments where we need to actually reflect. It, it disrupts our inherent flow. And a lot of times that's where our most creative time, creative ideas come from. They happen when you're in the shower, but maybe taking a jog or just having a casual conversation while getting a cup of coffee with somebody. Those moments have started to bleed away. And because of that, people are more productive but they have less ingenuity and less innovation. And that's been one of the most common quips that I've heard from senior leaders. We're getting a lot done, but we're not doing a whole lot differently. And we need some moments of innovative meaning to be able to do it. You can do it virtually, but you have to be really, really intentional about it. We spend a lot of time changing people's habits and tendencies. I did some work in you know years before in behavioral science and behavioral econ, and a lot of it is around design, making the right choices and designing for people's experience. And virtually, you have to do even more design than ever before than when you're in person, but it can be done. But you have to be intentional about it, you have to want to do it, and you have to value innovative output, speculative efforts versus sheer quantifiable productivity. And that's a tough thing to trade off on. People love productivity numbers. You look great, except when you need to do things differently. And that's when the house of cards comes down. So that's probably been one of the most common themes that I've seen. And it's kind of coming home to roost now. And you'll see a lot of leaders, a lot of people who need to do things differently are asking, what can you do to help me? Um, and we get lots and lots of calls and inquiries about that exact question about how to train and enable people and actually show it for people. So I, I would say that's probably one of the top things that I see. Right. So you're saying that people are becoming aware of the difference between productivity and innovation. So maybe maybe it's actually a great moment for for innovation in itself that that people realize that it's it's separate and it takes a different type of approach, right? It's not the everybody go along with what you're doing. The experts are experts and there always be experts. So 
Uh, to, to that, and, and I'm curious if other people are saying, you know, how has innovation in their own companies shifted with COVID? Um, I know that for us, you know, we talked a little bit about fear being a short-term driver, but that that's certainly, you know, the disruption that we felt, and we had an image think spurned a lot of things that were very different. We innovated a lot. Um, and, and some of you who are joining us might be in that boat too, where there was, you know, out of necessity, a lot of innovation really quickly. But do you all out there have questions for um, what does that look like now? Or how has that impacted? How has in innovation changed? Because the question that I have, Dan, is when you have a company or you're in a situation where there has been innovation or these changes, how do you sustain that momentum, right? Mm. Do you see that certain companies are just very good at not one pivot, but continually fostering that? Um, because as we talked about, you know, to Kelly's question is it, it takes a lot of work to make it happen. It takes a lot of execution. So what would you advise around, you know, sustainable innovation or keeping, uh, you know, keeping that change and that mindset going? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the old cliche, the or, or kind of aphorism that if, you know, if you want to give, if you uh, if you want someone to eat for a day, give a person a fish. If you want them to eat for a lifetime, teach them how to fish. It's very much the same thing here. That people run workshop sessions, will bring in third parties, and we're happy to help on the kind of the one-offs. But if you really want to to make innovation sustainable, you have to get into the DNA of the organization and of your people, and that means understanding what is the mindset, climate, and culture. What are you going to do if you don't feel like it's up to snuff, which often it's not? And then how do you enable people, train them? How do you kind of address some of the underlying cracks in the wall um, to be able to enable innovation to thrive? One of the most basic things that a lot of companies don't have is the this notion of psychological safety. That term gets thrown around a lot. A lot of people don't necessarily fully appreciate what it means. And, you know, it's this idea that, that people are not just – um, comfortable putting themselves out there, but they don't fear retaliation, that there is an environment led by your leaders, role modeled by them, that invites people to pivot, to fail, to do things differently. And it's not just a couple of people, but it's it's across the, you know, the hierarchy of the organization. Things like that enable for sustainable innovation. And, and it takes time, and it takes leadership, and it takes purpose. So there are a lot of things that have to happen. They can be trained, they can be taught, they have to be hired in for as well. Um, so it, it starts at the kind of the building blocks in the DNA of the organization. So, you know, when people think about innovation and a lot of people don't differentiate between the organizational side, it's kind of like, oh yeah, we can do that. And that's all feel good. That's hard to measure and quantify. That's for the long run. That's the fishing that you're teaching. The shorter run are these projects, initiatives, partnerships, collaborations, and those are important. Those might be the proof points or the evidence that you build and you give to your scene leaders is say, if we really build our culture and a climate of this, we could do this more sustainably. But it takes time and investment, and you have to have leadership buy-in and role modeling of that to make it stick. So it just doesn't happen overnight. Um, and and it, it does take time, but that's kind of how I think about how you build sustainable innovation is that it starts throughout the DNA of your, your company and your leaders. Yeah, that's, that's probably very true. You know, going back to just having that buy-in. So thinking again, also about, um, the question that Peter asked earlier, when you're in a culture where you have this, this expert mindset, you know, this fixed mindset and, uh, you how do you start? What would you say would be helpful for everybody out there listening, you know, thinking about the innovations in their own companies and maybe acknowledging it's a little bit harder to do right now? We're, we're prioritizing productivity, as you said, over innovation. What would be, um, you know, what is what effective cultural value or um, behavior that you've seen that we could think about trying to implement our own organizations? These yeah, I, I mean, there's so two things I'll mention. One is around this idea of of nurturing or building on each other's ideas. It's so basic and fundamental, and we just don't do it. 
um, or not enough. Some people are good at it, but I would actually get people, you know, when someone comes to you with an idea, um, build in the practice in the habit of of listening, not critiquing or judging right away, because our initial instinct is to kill ideas. We are kind of natural born idea killers. So actually work on that habit of nurturing, building ideas and finding possibility. Um, that in and of itself is a kind of a unit level or individual level skill that leaders can do what individuals can do and it's a practice and a habit which even when you're the most seasoned innovator that you can forget about you can absolutely forget about it so something like that is 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 a is a great thing to work on and how do you do it small bets little small things it doesn't have to be on the most grandiose projects make it small do it for an hour do it on one meeting do it in one session it doesn't have to be i'm going to do this for the next month that's a little bit overwhelming if you want to create change, you have to do things in small ways. We've learned that from behavioral science, that small steps, little bets are what win the bigger the bigger picture and the bigger game. So create little competitions. I'm going to try to nurture or build on someone's idea. And you don't have to be overboard with the theatrical of, oh, yes, and everything. Like, you know, people will start to be bothered by it if it's a little too much and a little too overboard. Um, do it in little subtle ways. And that's a little thing that anybody here can do. And I could tell you, I did, a, I wrote an article, if anyone's interested, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but it was real. It was called 24 Hours of Yes, where I challenged myself to say yes and build on every single thing that I heard. And my kids kind of caught on to that after about maybe 12 hours and started saying, can I go out all night and go out with friends and party? Can I go do this? And so I had to try to kind of rejigger my position a little bit, but, um, you know, it actually was incredibly liberating and incredibly hard to always find the positive and nurture ideas. So um, I'd give you that. Try that out. Little small things that you can do. So small bet, saying saying yes, listening to people's ideas, uh, starting small. I love that, actually. And I hopefully that resonates with Barbara Braun, who just asked, you know, how do you build this in um, to the DNA when you're in a company that's constantly changing roles? Uh, so that's that's fantastic because that's like you said the individual contributor something for us all to remember and that will help build that culture of safety and and risk taking right that you're talking about as being a bigger cultural um, element i uh i want to make sure that we have time to to uh hear about what you're doing next dan um dan does have his own methodology at the deliberate innovator built i think on probably the best of lots of different practices and he's so generous. There's a, there's many great videos um, out there, including the one that talks about this metaphors innovation. And you get to hear a little bit more about the ban and the deodorant story. Mm. But but Dan, what what are you excited about next? And if folks want to hear more, connect with you, where do they find you? Yeah, I mean, you can you can email me, Dan at deliberateinnovation.net. You can call me. You can find my stuff on online on my website as well. And you know. It, it could be to chat. You could also hit me up on LinkedIn. You know, we're all tethered to our technology these days. So you can find me if, if you want to chat. If you just have a, a thought or you disagree with something or you feel like we didn't go deep enough because we could go a lot deeper on every one of these topics. Happy to. Um, you know, it's something that, that I'm very passionate about and kind of the next big things, uh, you know, did a TEDx talk with NGIT a little while ago. They're trying to bring it to the main stage, which would be great. Um, it's about a topic that I feel very strongly about, which is about neurodegenerative diseases and what's stopping us from bringing uh, the solutions. Like we saw with Project Warp Speed, why can't we and why haven't we be able to gather together to solve some of these neurodegenerative diseases? Like my, my father and my grandfather had Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease. We have the capability and the wherewithal. And actually, it's a great example of metaphors of where else could other people apply things they're doing um, in the citizen science community, everyday scientists or non-scientists, people like all you and me that can contribute to moving the needle, which I'm 100% sure that we can because there's a lot of precedent for it. So I'm a very, I'm not just an advocate, it's not just a great story, but it's something personally that's that that I feel strongly about. I'd love to see that change. So. You know, every project and, and thing that you work on, you're hoping it's going to make a difference. And it's not just about turning a buck. It's about actually making a dent. 
And, uh, you know, as one, one great mind said, you want to make your dent in the universe. And, you know, I'd like to make mine about changing people's minds around how do you solve problems. And, you know, I see it every day and I'm looking forward to, to seeing some greater impact in the things that matter most to me. That, that's great, Dan. Um, it's been such a, a privilege to have you here. And Thank I'm you. sure that every every cause that you're putting your uh, your intention behind from Parkinson's to all of the myriad client problems that you're working on are going to benefit from clear thinking and insight around how you frame up a problem, how you understand the problem, how you approach the problem. So I agree. We could have went deep into all of these. It was so much fun. We didn't even get to nerd out about Fleming and penicillin. So that, that'll be another time. Um, but I think we could have worked it in here. So, um, so thank you so much. If you would like to circle back um, to hear this again, you can find it at imagethink.com backslash events. Um, also very visible, but very silent member of this production today was Aaron Mapor, who has captured, I think, so beautifully some of these great concepts that, that Dan has introduced. So this will also uh, be uh, living on LinkedIn so you can access the visual summary, Aaron from Image Think Created. Thank you, Aaron, for that. And uh, thanks again, Dan, for joining us. We'll reach out to everybody who posted comments, questions, and, and choose a, a winner to receive Draw Your Big Idea. And join us back next month in May where uh, I will have another guest expert on. I'm very excited about it. Um, Dan, any parting thoughts before, before you go uh, for us to remember when we think about innovating? Only parting thought is enjoy the fresh air and the beautiful outside while you can. And uh, I look forward to chatting with everyone at some point in the future. So be well and uh, stay innovating. Great, thanks so much, Dan.